Hi, I'm Graham Phillips. I'm playing George in Sunday in the Park with George at the Axelrod Performing Arts Center, and we open this weekend, March 8th. I was going to say what your go-to song would be at an open mic in the spirit of the show. I feel like in the vein of MT, like musical theater world, that'd probably be suddenly Seymour, because I, oh. I love a duet moment. Yeah, exactly. Who would you bring up as your ideal duet partner? Probably Liz Gillies. Okay. <laughs> um, we, did 13, we did 13 together and um, she's like, I don't know. She always seems like such a lounge lizard. You know, she's like a cabaret <laughs> star from like the twenties in another life or actually in this life, honestly. Um, and she, okay. she actually always hosts uh, these epic karaoke nights at her place with a pianist that are really fun so that maybe yeah. awesome. although last time i was over there she was singing suddenly seymour with seth uh uh mcfarland and they did a pretty good job so i might have to come up with another song fair enough fair enough i mean i'm sure you could do it i'm sure you could do it just as well <laughs> <laughs> that's it. so funny lounge lizard is such a good way to describe somebody you know i love that yeah <laughs> It's strange that it's actually a compliment, you know, right. you see how someone who's like lounging all the time or someone who's, you know, if you refer to someone as a reptile or like a snake, it's usually not a good thing, but lounge <laughs> lizard just. just yeah, just... that's perfect. I would accept that with so much grace. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So then um, being George in the show, what's your get ready with me routine? So I haven't started, we open on Friday, so I haven't really done the full routine, but I did okay. this show a year ago at Pasadena Playhouse. Okay. And that was super nerve wracking because the last professional musical I'd done, if you don't count The Little Mermaid live, which was uh, nerve wracking in its own way. But, um, you know, as far as a legit, usual like musical experience, um, the last professional musical I did was 13. So I was like 16 years old. I'm 30 now. I was 29 when I did the last version of Sunday in the Park with George. So that was a long time. And, um, you know, like my voice was changing during 13. It was a long time ago. And so, yeah, I had a lot of nerves. Um, and just to help ground me, I uh, pretty much every day I'd find... I'd go into a steam room for like 20 minutes and um, whether it was at a gym or whatever, or friend's house. And then I'd do a really long warm up. I'd warm up with a straw and a bottle, which really helps to get the throat open. And um, I do a meditation. My dressing room is super vibey. I had like all these colored lights and I could change like all the colors and it could be really dim blue or it could be whatever. Um, and uh yeah i just would take it really slow i'd get like i'd get there like an hour and a half to two hours before the show and i'm someone who if i don't watch myself i'll start rushing i'll mm -hmm. go from this to that to this to that so just to have enough time to not be rushed was huge for me yeah absolutely i love i love that your your dressing room was vibey and somewhere you wanted to be somewhere you wanted to lounge like Elizabeth yeah, exactly I needed a probably I didn't have any Christmas trees or plants mm. so we all have to fair hold. enough fair enough fair enough Is and a real I, Christmas tree it's not I've never ever had a real Christmas tree and I didn't know that people like had real ones until I got to college so I'm from Texas and we just I mean there's some parts of Texas I guess that do it but not not where I'm from. So I, I was like, what? People put real trees in their house? I guess that, that makes sense, though. <laughs> what part of Texas are you from? Waco, where... Um, I know. <laughs> I'm <alive. laughs> yeah, My mom's from Wichita some... Falls, Texas. So no there's way. nothing really famous from there. But yeah. That's yeah, so cool. Like Texas and the other half is their Oklahomies. I love, I love, I love. Do you... What are your thoughts on Texas? Are you like, oh, I like it. I like going there or like, e -e. <laughs> I love Texas. I mean, I, Me I my mom's <laughs> in um, Fort Worth right now for a horse show before she flies out for opening. Um, cool. She'll ride yeah. a lot. 
Yeah, um, I grew up doing that too. My I never had horses, but I was a horse girl. My neighbors all had horses. So that way I didn't have to take care of them, but I could still reap all the benefits. That's the way to do it. To not right? own and take care and be responsible for a horse, but have an, a horse to be horse accessible. Exactly. And it was awesome. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Okay. I didn't know that. That's so cool. Um, yeah. But hopping back into the questions, if you had any advice for somebody new getting into like the Broadway theater scene, what's one thing that you would tell them? That's tough. My answer for someone who's trying to get onto the on-screen world is just do it. Like write something, even if it sucks, um, just make something. And it's not really your, it's not really your business to think that something is, um, a bad idea or even a new idea. There's a great line in, in um, Move On. Um, Stop worrying if your vision is new. Let others make that decision. They usually do. And mm -hmm. what I take from that is just go for it. It's your time to be alive and you know express yourself and don't worry about what other people think. Easier said than done, of course. But um, on the on the on screen side, you know, cameras are so cheap. You can film something that is really compelling on your iPhone. And, you know, some software and just getting together and doing it. When it comes to something on stage, that's a great question because you can't really do it. You need, you kind of do need an audience. It's a weird situation where you, you have to have a space to do it. And um, I mean, if you can get into a class, just get into a class and get up on any kind of platform and start getting messy and don't fall into a trap of this needs to be done this way, or there's a right way or a wrong way. Um, Willem Dafoe, who's one of my favorite actors, he did an interview and he was talking about, has some expletives, so I'll cut those out, but he's like, <laughs> you no, know, sometimes when I'm on set, I just really try to, you know, every once in a while, I'll just really screw it up, you know, <laughs> like just to see what happens because it just gets you out of that whole, like right and wrong place. It's like, you know, how can I really deliver this line and where it's really going to suck? Like really, really just gum it up. And, yeah. um, and I love that because then when you do that, the whole part of your nervous system starts to relax that that's trying to make everything just so and not make a mistake. And I think ultimately that's why so many people are drawn to performance because they actually don't want to live like that. And, and somewhere in, in their soul or their mind, they know that the stakes aren't as high when you're on stage, but it's takes a lot of work to self-regulate and remind yourself that this is not real life, which is weird because so much of what you're doing is trying to get specific enough to make it feel like real life. Um, so anyways, I guess as far as advice, classes and finding artists that you are really inspired by. And if there's an actor who you really, um, who you really admire and maybe you see a part of yourself in, Look at their interviews and look at um you know pretty much every actor does interviews and they'll talk about who their teachers are and who they were inspired by and look them up and read about it um and you can kind of go you can you can find your own path and your own curriculum by choosing the constellation of people that you're inspired by and then just learning on how they did it Absolutely. Those are great answers. Those are so, so helpful, I'm sure. Um, and I love Willem Dafoe. So that's a great little connection there. Loved him in Fantastic Mr. Fox, of course. So, <laughs> so good. <laughs> um, but okay, yeah. Poor things yet? What'd you say? Have you seen Poor Things? I haven't, but I my friends went and saw it and they went without me, which was really not cool of them, but it's fine. I'll get over it. So now I have no one to watch it with, but I'll have to, and I'm like a little nervous to watch it by myself because I know it's kind of, it's intense. Huh? <laughs> I don't know. I, I really liked it, but I'd recommend a buddy to okay. so have someone to look at when it's done and go, what the heck? <laughs> it's yeah. pretty, pretty bizarre. Maybe I'll, I'll find somebody. I'll track somebody down. I know there's gotta be someone. So. <laughs> okay. In terms of the new show, I know it hasn't started yet, but what is like the most challenging part thus far and how have you overcome it? I think one of the challenges is just time. When you're doing really putting anything up, whether it's a film or, or a show, you just don't, 
you can never quite have an, as much time as you want, unless you're like Scorsese and you have a hundred days to film. You're like, yeah, the clouds are out. I don't want to film today. Um, <laughs> we had three weeks to put this show up and this show is a beast and the devil is in the details on this show. If you're familiar with it, act one is, it's, pro it's like one of the most bizarre acts in musical theater, I think. Um, it's gorgeous. But it's like a it's like a music box that if or like a watch or something where if everything is not just so the whole thing falls apart. Like if the energetic ball drops, it's like there's so many disparate, strange components that need to fit together in order to make it feel like a whole, which is intentional. It's mirroring the painting, which has all of these little tiny components that if they're all not in the right position, when you take a step back, it all falls apart. Um, so just really gelling these transitions from place to place has been tricky. Um, it's, it's a different challenge than the last one because Eamon has introduced this really cool element of contemporary ballet of six dancers on point representing six of the colors that George would have used um, in the painting. And um, so having six more bodies on stage that are helping to tell the emotional part of this story and also um, in some ways representing uh, creativity itself and inspiration in a sense that when you really are inspired and in a creative flow state, it doesn't feel like something that you're doing. It's not mechanical. It's something that works through you and something that maybe you're just open to and things become a little bit easier. And so having these moments when George is able to, when I'm able to just focus on the painting and not focus on telling the story about how incredible it is that I'm painting, the dancers are doing a lot of that work for me. So I get to literally focus on the joy of just putting <laughs> ink or uh, pigment on canvas. And I can trust that as long as I feel it, we're good because they're, they're sort of telling the spectacle of it. Um, and of course the music, does a lot of it as well. But yeah, I'd say that the challenge has been time, the time management and with the fact that, you know, Eamon's having to choreograph sort of a ballet at the same time as he's putting up Sunday in the Park with George, but it's working. And it seems like just like every show I do in the last three days, you know, you're on, you're got the, you're in the plane and you're like, how are we going to do it? And then you just last second, find the runway and somehow lands. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great um, metaphor. I, I totally resonate too. And with the time thing, it's like, oh, there's never enough time for anything <laughs> ever, but, um, but I love, and goodness gracious, have you ever worked in like a ballet, like something that has ballet in it before? Is this kind of new realm for you? No, I don't think I have. I've been around it. Um, I, funny when Eamon and I were at Princeton, our first year, he wanted to do a concept video for Color and Light um, with the dancers. And I, and I was like, okay, I'll help you out. And I, I shot it for him and I edited it. And, um, and so I've filmed ballet dancers. And weirdly, I filmed the choreography. It's very similar to the choreography that's now surrounding me in Color and Light now that I'm playing George. And that was, a, I don't know, 11 years ago or something. So it's kind of funny to look back on how this industry works. I mean, Eamon was just a friend who needed a hand doing something creative and now I'm playing George. So I guess that goes back to maybe my advice, which is find your people. And it, this industry works in strange circuitous ways. So if you have a chance to help someone out and um, learn something, even if it's something that you think maybe you won't directly help you out in the long run, like get involved. Um, there's a lot of creatives that are sitting on their tuchus and, you know, find something to do. You never know. Yeah. It might be the reason that someone casts you 11 years later. Absolutely. I love that. I love it. How it's like, kind of like the invisible string that was pulling you the all along. I love totally. <laughs> very Taylor Swift. <laughs> um, cool. Well then I guess since this is the most, like recent thing you've been in. do you remember your first time on stage and like what that was like for you uh yeah i was in kindergarten i was playing star to be 
in Annie, Annie Jr. A historically female role. Um, <laughs> and it's a pretty dim memory, but I remember, it's just so funny because the, the role itself is literally talking about like the hope of, you know, something of the potential of, of, of what's going to happen in show business. Um, and go into the big city and, you know, I had my bags and, and, uh, I think <laughs> as a kid that, that was a little, like, I don't know. I, I, I was a little hard to handle when I was young. Um, and usually when, when I was getting attention, it was, you know, sometimes entertaining, but like a lot of the times it was usually followed immediately by a like now calm down like you're you're being the class clown or you're whatever so to just be up there and to have captured everyone's attention and for it to be like sanctioned and actually the thing that i'm supposed to be doing felt really good mm. and i don't think it was just like attention hog stuff I'm sure that that's there. We all have a degree of vanity, but I think some of it was, you know, there's a lot of um, confusing messaging when you're growing up as far as like get in line, pull it together, um, you know, stay quiet. You know, there's that, it's maybe not quite as bad here as it is in like certain parts of, you know, England or, or wherever. Um, but you know, the whole mind your P's and Q's thing, it can make you feel like the best way to get by is to make yourself smaller and more quiet and um, to conform and to be able to have a space where the opposite is encouraged is really important. Um, and I think that shows in musical theater in particular, because it's particularly ridiculous, um, <laughs> or it can be at least, you know, it's, uh, I'll say this, it's particularly big. And yeah. for that to be encouraged is really special. And I think that what I was experiencing on stage when I was really young was just how magical it is to feel like I have permission to be as big as I want. Yeah. I've never heard that so well put. So a plus plus. <laughs> I love it. And that's so funny that that was your first role. I love it. That's a great first role. <laughs> okay. I have to ask about um, you getting the snot beat out of you in Riverdale. And I was wondering what that was like. And if you could like break down that scene for us. <laughs> I don't really remember much about it. I remember we had our stunt coordinator and uh I honestly don't even remember, like, was he, did he hit me in the face or what? I think my legs were, were my legs like broken. I don't, I honestly don't remember because I, <laughs> I, I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You don't have to. Do you usually, if you are on screen ever, like, do you usually watch what you've been in or are you kind of like, I did that. I lived it already. As a person, I'm generally like, all right, done and on to the next. Um, that said, I think if there's something for me to learn from it, I'll watch it. Mm -hmm. I think my attitude on Riverdale was, um, I know what they want, but I'm going to give it to them. Mm -hmm. And when I, when you go in with that attitude, certainly when I do, like, I know what it's going to look like. And it's not going to be that interesting for me to, to see because it's, it's fairly controlled in a way. Like everything is, you know, calculated. I kind of leaned into the sort of the melodrama uh, undertones of the series and was like, yeah, okay, I'm just gonna go like full villain and like push that. And, um, but I think that my best work and what I'm hoping keeps developing in me is uh, when I show up on the day and I have choices and I know what's going on, but I really, I'm living in the moment to the point where I don't know what's going to happen. Just like, we don't know what's going to happen in this interview. Like, you know, 
bah, anything could happen. Um, <laughs> and when that happens, and particularly in something in film or TV, when you're surrendering your performance over to an editor, sometimes uh, I am interested in how it's going to come together because you just you just never know. Partly because you're giving something away, you're giving more options to an editor as opposed to in a more controlled um, performance. There's only so much that they can do to make you look ridiculous or great. Um, whereas when you give a lot of different varieties, you know, there's more that they can, there's a lot, you, they have more ingredients. They can make a different kind of stew. Um, my brother and I, so my brother and I direct together and we've had this experience in the editing room where an actor will come in and they'll just nail it. And we love that. And they'll do it the same way every time, more or less. And they'll take direction well, but you know, they're super consistent. And that's sometimes an asset. Um, and then we have another actor. We have a, a few actors that do this, but one in particular comes in and just completely fires from the hip. And it's like, every take is completely different and it's kind of wild and he can take direction too, but it's, he's a loose cannon. And um, when we're in the edit, we find that his performance has become the most compelling because we have so many different uh, colors to play mm -hmm. with. And also the fact that he didn't know how some, something was gonna come out of his mouth until it did, which is like how 90% of human interactions go. Um, it's unconscious. We're not consciously saying, I'm going to say it this way. There is a sort of electricity and a danger to it. Um, that's really captivating. And I think that there's a lot of actors that do that, like Tom Hardy. And I think that I've seen Shia LaBeouf do it. Um, Meryl Streep is really great at that. Uh, there's so many wonderful actors who they're able to make choices, but there's something sort of the animal in them that's unpredictable is alive and well in the room. And um, I think that if I was doing work that's more like that, I would really want to see it. But if I know what I'm doing, I'm kind of like, I saw it, I was there. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely, that totally makes sense. That's so cool though. And speaking of like other actors that you've um, worked with, what is it like seeing everybody from 13, like kind of come into their own and do their own thing throughout the years? You know, the people that I was closest with it was Aaron Simon Gross, Eamon Foley, Ali Trim, Ariana, and Liz Gillies. Like those are really the people that I got closest to. Um, and they've all really done incredible work, um, you know, in their own and, and not all in the same ways. Like Eamon stopped acting after 13. Um, He's an incredible choreographer. Tony winning directors go to him to do choreography. This is one of his first shows where he's really doing everything. I mean, he's produced it, directed it, chore he's the choreographer. And I'm just so proud to see him come into his own. Um, and so lucky to just get to, get to work with him and see all of the things that made him have, you know, that, mi that might've been a challenge before be his superpower now that he's in a position of authority. Like he's just, he's such a creative, unique, um, graceful, sensitive uh, individual. And yeah, that's been amazing. Obviously Ariana has gotten to super stardom and um, you know, and she's just still you know, through it all, through all the crazy stuff that's happened to her and um, all the amazing successes and all of the difficulties, she's that, that light is just shining so bright. And I'm, that's really what I think I'm most happy to see. Um, Liz, <laughs> she's, I love Liz. And I just think what's so funny about Liz is how, her grow like growing into her womanhood that was already kind of she's always seemed like like 40 years old to me even when she was like 15 <laughs> she has this like i don't know like 
1930s, 40s film star, lounge lizard. Um, An old soul. Temperament. Yeah, old school. And, and I just, I, I just love it. I could just eat it up. And it's just, it's so wonderful to see her, her creativity align with who she is. Mm -hmm. She also loves trying new things. And I, I just think she's so, um, she has such an adventurous side in what she chooses to do. And, um, yeah, she's, she's someone who, if, if anyone gets a chance to spend uh, an extended amount of time with them, and if they're the kind of person that at some point would have an autobiography, like there'd probably be a chapter dedicated to her just because of like what a unique and cool cat she is. I, it's so nice to like hear that, like all the things that they've been doing. That's really so cool. And I love it. <laughs> okay. I've got two more really quick questions for you and then I'll let you get back to the rest of your day. Um, but I was wondering what it was like to play Prince Eric in front of so many people. <laughs> so my, my niece, who's now uh, 13 years old, um, she, she is a huge Little Mermaid fan. She was like eight at the time. And part of the reason why I did it was um, I was in the phase. I needed, a, I needed a boost in the cool uncle front. Yeah, exactly. That was pretty cool. He's five years older than me. And I was like, I need to, I need to catch up. Um, and I was really stoked when I got it. And then I started, you know, when you hear that like millions of people are going to be watching you live when that's not something you do, you know, it's one thing if you are like an Ariana or you are, uh, you know, Usher or something, you're like, yeah, like yeah. I do this kind of stuff. Um, and you eventually, you get used to it, you know, but I had never, I'd never been in a situation where I, I was 10 seconds away, assuming that's like what the live delay was from like completely humiliating myself in front of millions of people. So like you can imagine that, you know, your mind can play tricks on you and yeah. start to imagine like, well, what if this, well, what if that? So I just had to get really mentally strong and like bombard myself with positive thinking and um, which was important also for the character. Like, mm -hmm. Great. He's, he's a pretty fun loving, like he's, he's generally portrayed as a pretty simple guy. And, um, I don't think I'm the most simple person, but I, I think that I, I, I do love fun. I don't know that many people who don't, but, um, I really, there's a lot about the character, the character, Eric definitely represents like a part of my personality for sure. And um, I was like, to do this service, like I really get to lean into that. Um, one thing that really helps to ground me in a performance is to do, that helps me get out of my, like my gourd and to really drop into my body is to do a lot of physical work. And um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Alexander technique, but it's like, a, yeah. it's like a way of it's sort of like a it's been described as like a bone meditation kind of thing where you that's probably the wrong way to describe it but it's you you it's really just relaxation and like learning what neutral feels like in your body because we all hold like chronic you know we hold in our body what we're feeling in our in our minds and our hearts and so you know we might someone who needs to really protect their heart might be more like this or you know, someone who's always like, feels like they got to run, like might have their shoulders up and like, you know, their head forward or anyways, we all have these unconscious things that happen in our bodies. And so to find what neutral is, so then a, you're not just holding on to chronic tension, um, which can generally help with singing if you let go of that. Um, but also it helps you listen to someone else. Like it's hard to hear someone if you're holding on to a lot of tension. So to feel safe enough to relax and really see and hear what's happening right in front of you, that's good for performance and just life. Um, but once you find, once you get closer to 
being in a neutral place, you can then add on whatever the character's physical, you know, experience might be. And one way to do that is through animal work, where you pick an animal that seems inspiring for a character, and Ooh. then, um, and then you, you you play around as that animal, and then you sort of scale it back to the point where it no longer seems ridiculous, <laughs> but it's still you're still inhabiting it. And for Prince Eric, I don't even really remember why, but it just came to me, uh, the animal of a dolphin. That and checked out to me. I don't know why. <laughs> so I just, something about like the sort of openness of the mind, even like the blowhole, like just sort of this <laughs> like um, really like open, like crown chakra, like mind, you know, energy of the dolphin and dolphin like just how dolphins are like they play they're so smart but they choose to you know they yeah. choose to play and frolic and like they're super curious and they and they have that smile and they um and they have their long I mean I'm, my instructor um Jean-Louis Rodrigue he he's incredible and he's so funny like whenever we're working we'll be on like a table and he'll be like and this is, you know, you have your knees, your hips, your ankles, and reminding us that we have time and it's all very calm. And he's like, and you have your feet. Oh, boy, oh, that's a flipper over there. Whoa, he's just like such a goofball about it. Um, but anyway, it just helps. It helps also realize, helps me remember that this is fun. I I never thought about that before as a possibility, but that that's really cool. I love that. <laughs> You can see when you watch a lot of actors use it, and sometimes you can actually tell when you're watching something. Um, Which animal? <laughs> he works with Margot Robbie, and she uses animals for pretty much everything that she does. And sometimes you can you'll see it, and you know you can you, you can see it. I don't know if you watch Succession, but like Logan Roy, like it's like he seems like a rhinoceros. Or you'll see a, there was one show he pointed out. I think it was in someone was playing Marie Antoinette. Or Queen Elizabeth or someone who had like just this very unusual posture and he worked with her and, and she wanted to use a praying mantis mm. for like how she as a royal like would like move, move around and sort of have this like killer energy but also like have a sort of unusual you know way of moving it's just fun yeah. to think about that's cool. I like that. I like that. That's so cool. It's nice to get a little bit of insight. I feel like I'm in an exclusive club now. <laughs> Um, okay. And then the last question that we have is just, what do you want people to get out of um, the show, the upcoming show, and you playing George in Sunday in the Park of George? <laughs> At the core of the show, and particularly in this interpretation of the show, the importance of movement, sometimes like physical movement as a way of helping get the other things moving. Like if the heart is stuck in a certain pattern or the brain is stuck in the same narrative, saying the same exact thing, saying, uh, I'm afraid of this thing, I'm afraid of this thing, or like, no, I really need this thing to be happy. I need this thing. Physical movement um, to break that frozen state um, is so important. And I think the dancers are doing an incredible job of showing that. And I hope that anyone who comes in who feels stuck, and we all feel stuck, um, will be reminded that it's as easy as moving. I mean, there's a reason why the, the core of the whole show is a song called Move On. Mm -hmm. um, and this last time that we were uh, running the show, you know, every time I'm listening to Move On, I, I pick up on something different. But um, just that in order to be really present, with what's happening right now, it's not just about releasing our ideas of what's happening in the future or even what happened in the distant past. It's like, as soon as the moment's passed, we release our attachment to it because there's another one right here. Mm -hmm. And that was really new for me because sometimes it feels like when I'm really present, if I'm really in something and it's wonderful, like I want to collect it and I need to like hold on to it. And so much of what the show is about is that 
it, it, it goes. And that's sort of where the magic of all of this lies. It can be sad sometimes, but that's also what's so exciting. Um, and I think that that's, you know, so many of us are addicted to recording everything and putting everything on our phones. And I think some of that, and some of that's beautiful, but some of that is, I think, a way of protecting against the fact that when the moment's gone, it's gone. And that's something that's really hard to think about or look at. But when you really do look at it and you go through whatever emotions that might bring up, you end up really cherishing what's right in front of you and really being here for it. And I think that, you know, that's what, that's what this show's about. Yeah. Absolutely. Man, I'm like about to cry because I can so relate, <laughs> you know? Um, and then like going to a concert and people are always videoing the whole concert. I'm like, you're not going to watch that. You're just afraid to forget it. So um, I totally get it. That's so very well put. Um, we're very excited for the show to come out. My um, my producer's a big fan. Um, but yeah, so thanks so much again for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. Hi, I'm Graham Phillips. I'm playing George in Sunday in the Park with George at the Axelrod Performing Arts Center, and we open this weekend, March 8th.